Bien, retomamos nuestro ciclo de conferencias de IXS2 2023. Ahora daremos inicio al último panel de IXS2 2023. El panel 6, titulado Best Practice of LGBTIQ+, Inclusion in Maritime Organizations. Este panel busca visibilizar iniciativas que fomentan la inclusión y la protección del colectivo LGBTQI+, dentro del sector marítimo. Asimismo, busca promover políticas equitativas, inclusivas e íntegras que protejan al colaborador LGBTIQ+, y mecanismos de control y verificación de la aplicación de estas. En este panel, el moderador es el señor Iván Chanis Barahona. Les cuento un poco sobre Iván. Iván Chanis es abogado magna cum laude, egresado de la USMA. Obtuvo una maestría en políticas públicas MPP de la Escuela de Gobierno de la Universidad de Oxford. Posee, además, un máster en Derecho por la Universidad de New York y estudios de Relaciones Internacionales y Diplomacia. Él es presidente y creador de la Fundación Iguales Panamá, organización cuya misión es eliminar la discriminación por diversidad sexual, estableciendo y fortaleciendo programas de diagnóstico, sensibilización, promoción y defensa de los derechos. Bienvenido al señor Iván Chanes. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, primero, agradecer la invitación a estar frente a este distinguido público en este histórico día o días de celebración de algo tan importante como visibilizar las vidas, las historias, las necesidades de personas LGBTIQ+, en la industria marítima. Primero, agradecer a Gustavo, todos lo han hecho. Gustavo, tú eres un amigo personal y te digo hoy, tú lo dices de mí, pero yo lo digo de ti, tú eres un héroe hoy para mí y para muchas personas. Así que primero un aplauso para ti por todo el esfuerzo de todos estos meses y el éxito que ya se ha materializado. Yo estoy acá eh, para hablar de, en el panel, o moderar más bien el panel, Best Practice of LGBTIQ+, Inclusion in Maritime Organizations. Quiero decir que eh, inicialmente yo estaba en un panel más temprano, pero ahora sé es el último. Creo que es un gran reto eh, mantenerlos felices, interesados, que no se duerman. Eh, pero bueno, si están acá y han logrado un gran trecho, así que bear with me one more hour. Yo no lo dije Aaron, en mi presentación, pero yo soy profesor certificado de yoga a la orden. Así que vamos a hacer algo no convencional para que no se duerman. Los que quieran, los que no quieran se pueden quedar sentados, aquí no se obliga a nada, esto es un espacio seguro e inclusivo. Los que se quieran parar y simplemente estirarse. ¿Pararse? Alce las manos y lo lleven hasta arriba, arriba, arriba y miren al techo. Los que puedan pararse de puntillas y mantener... El balance, un momento, estiren, estiren, todo lo que puedan, sienta que estiran así como se levanta en la mañana. Perfecto. Eso es todo. Ya con eso, tienen una hora de energía. <risa> Yo no quiero estar solo acá y voy a llamar a los, a los panelistas que están conmigo presentes. Si quieren me puedo ir acompañando eh, y vamos a hacer las presentaciones. Primero voy a, eh, a presentar a William, lo voy a presentar en español. William es abogado costarricense, licenciado en Derecho por la Universidad de Costa Rica, con una maestría en Derechos Humanos en la Universidad de Valencia, en España. Cuenta con más de 15 años de experiencia en la defensa y promoción de los derechos humanos y es oficial de Derechos Humanos en la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de Naciones Unidas por los Derechos Humanos. Bienvenido, William. Ginger Garter is an Environmental and Sustainability Director at Lloyd's Register Maritime Decarbonization Hub. She's a protector of the planet, a sustainability advocate armed with more than 30 years of maritime experience. In her current role, she's part of the Lloyd's Register Maritime Decarbonization Hub team. She's dually seconded to Lloyd's Register Foundation Resilience Rising Resilience for Ports Innovation Lab. Together 
we're in a mission working for a safer, sustainable, thriving ocean economy for all. Welcome. We have two other guests that will join us either on a video or live stream. So I'll introduce Martin Ellingold. Uh, Martin has had a career that has been dedicated to human rights, having worked for public bodies, non for profits, and for the UN. He's now head of operations at Human Rights at Sea, a charity dedicated to preventing, detecting, and remitting human rights abuses at sea. And last but not least, Niels Help. I'm very sorry if I'm pronouncing your last names properly. Um, you can, awesome. So Niels was born in 1963, had been head of the corporate communications at Hapak Lloyd since the end of 2014. After studying in Frankfurt, uh, he began his career at the advertising agency J. Walter Thompson in Frankfurt. He then worked for many years as a television editor and television producer at Middle Doucher Brandfunk. He has been in the PR industry since 2000. Director of Communication for the Americas for the Lufthansa Group in New York and was responsible for communications in North and South America at, uh, sorry, at Hapak Lloyd as Senior Director of Corporate Communication. He's responsible for global internal and external communications and marketing communications. In addition, he's part of the executive board of Hapak Lloyd Foundation. With that introduction, we're going to start this with the video that we have received to open this panel. Hi, I'm delighted to be able to join you today via video, and I'm deeply saddened not to be with you in person. Illnesses meant I'm unable to travel at the moment, so I'm joining you from the UK remotely. My name is Martin Illingworth and I'm the Head of Operations for Human Rights at Sea. We're a human rights charity focused on the rights of people at sea. We exist to prevent, detect and remedy human rights abuses around the world. As you will have heard over the duration of this exceptional event, the lives of LGBTQ plus people at sea can be exceptionally difficult. Many of us are fortunate enough to live in countries where LGBTQ plus rights are largely taken for granted now and where attitudes are increasingly supportive. And I know that I have considerable privilege as a gay male living in Western Europe. And I believe it's incumbent on me to use that privilege and incumbent on others to use their privilege to support others. There are still 67 countries in the world where my sexuality as a gay person is illegal and many more countries where the prevailing attitude towards homosexuality and queerness is negative. Human Rights at Sea knows of people serving on vessels who have gotten into trouble with local law enforcement when docked in port purely because of who they are. We also know of plenty of gay men and women who feel unsafe disembarking in certain countries. And then we know of countless examples of gay people feeling unable to come out at work or queer people being bullied and harassed at work because of their sexuality, being physically assaulted even. And sadly, we also know of cases where People have taken their lives at sea because of their sexuality and how people treat them. Now, these issues aren't easy to solve. Changing laws along with hearts and minds is never simple. But the inescapable facts are that we have a global maritime workforce that has to visit coastal nations and has to work alongside people from hundreds of different countries. We cannot change laws and attitudes overnight, but we can make a start. Maritime companies have to have fully inclusive policies and procedures. But more than that, they have to make sure that these inclusive policies and practices are translated into actual practical action on board vessels. 
Corporate culture set in headquarters based in liberal countries doesn't always translate to life aboard vessels. Companies have to assure themselves that they are walking the walk as well as talking the talk when it comes to inclusive policies and practices. They also need to use their considerable weight to advocate for and support law, policy and attitude changes in countries in which they operate and visit. Business has a role to play in supporting, protecting and promoting human rights around the world. The UN Guiding Principles is something that all maritime companies need to be intimately familiar with. Because ultimately, the lives of the LGBTQ people who work for these companies are important and we deserve more than a pride cluttered logo once a year. Thank you very much. We thank you, Martin, for that and taking the time to send uh, the video. Well, going back to the people here, um, I just want to remind you that this panel aims to highlight initiatives that promote inclusion and protection of LGBTIQ plus employees in the maritime sector. Additionally, we look forward to seek to promote fair, inclusive, and comprehensive policies that safeguard the rights of LGBTQ plus employees, along with effective mechanisms for monitoring and enforcing their implementation. So, with that aim, uh, I would start asking uh, Nils for him to talk a little bit about inclusive policies for LGBTQ plus employees at Hapag Lloyd. Can we have mm. Nils on screen, please? Thank you very much. Yeah. I hope Thank you. you can hear me and you can see me. Um, yes, we can hear you. Good morning from Germany. It's 12.30 at night today here in Germany and I'm very happy to join you. Me gustaría hablar en español, pero mi español lastimosamente está muy mal y entonces voy a continuar en inglés. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the um, LGBT efforts we have done within Habak Lloyd. Just a few words about Habak Lloyd. Founded 1847, so a very old shipping line. I'm 176 years old, and unfortunately, I have to admit that only for a few years we have started a process which is still ongoing in, you know, really looking at diversity and inclusion. And I would like to give you a very small overview. Perhaps we could start with the presentation, please. So I would like to talk a little bit about our commitment, which has really changed in the last years. And I think we have achieved a lot, but we are by far not where we would like to be, especially when it comes to, as my uh, the previous uh, uh, speaker said, you know, when we talk about people on board, still the situation is difficult because it is very difficult to include those people being on board of the vessels into the internal communication, which is, you know, for the blue collar worker very easily, or for the, sorry, for the white collar worker very easy, but for the blue collar workers, you know, intranet or, you know, being involved in internal communications is somehow difficult. I would like to show you a movie. Uh, it's, it's a very short one um, about, you know, how our HR people and employees value our um, efforts on diversity and inclusion. Could we start the video, please? Do we have a sound as well? It is the diversity aspects. Be loud, be proud. As an openly queer person, it's awesome to work at a company that supports me and everyone else. LGBTQ, our stance, our container, rainbows flashing. We have colors. We don't even see any differences in terms of race, gender, age. We are all one big family. We had the first woman in the board, which was a great example for all of us. It showed diversity. I'm really, really looking forward to having a diverse workforce and working with diverse talents. We want to make people more youthful, regardless of age. We love the glide for diversity. Yeah, thank you very much. Could we have the next slide? Yeah, thanks a lot. 
So when we talk about Hapagloid, you have to take into account that since 2014, the, the company has changed tremendously. In, in 2014, we were 7,000 people and we were in the shipping crisis and there was only one chance, which meant one chance for survival, which meant we need to grow. And this is why we merged with several companies where we bought a Chilean shipping line CSIV 2014. We bought an Arab shipping line in 2017, which was UASC. We bought a an African shipping line 2020, which was Nile Dutch in 2021, we bought Deutsche Afrika. That means we doubled the number of our employees. And of course, also, we are now really a very global company with a strong fit foothold in the Middle East, in South America, and of course in Germany, but also in India, where we have the biggest workforce. So if you look at our global code of ethics, which you have to sign when you enter the company, um, it says, you know, that there are several principles you, you, you have to obey to, which are binding for each and every employee, whether you are in Egypt, in Germany, in Peru, or in the United States. And I mark two in red, which is the respect for the personality and the dignity of the individual and the prohibition of any discrimination. And perhaps another example, which is quoted in, in our Global Code of Ethics. Next, next slide, please. So here it says, um, so uh, they're, they're under, the, under the treatment and discrimination, you know, actions will not be tolerated, which are discriminating. And then you could also see that we don't tolerate any misbehavior in that. I give you a small example. We had um, an Egyptian colleague and he was commenting on LinkedIn under his full name and under his Habak Lloyd employee name under a photo of Maersk, who was participating in the gay pride parade in Copenhagen. And he, he was uh, writing, you know, these people are pervert, they need to be incarcerated. So as he signed a contract with a European company, which has a global code of ethics, which really says, you know, that we need and we, we expect tolerance of our employees. Now we didn't kick him out, but we made him very clear. If you are working for a European company with a global code of ethics, you have to live these ethics. And um, I mean, people can think whatever they want, right? In private, but when you're working for a company and you sign something or you're in social media under the name of the company, you have to obey this global code of ethics. And we are very strong with that. Next slide, please. So um, we have 14,000 people in 135 countries. We have lots of people in the Middle East, as I said, in India, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in Dubai, um, but also lots of people in Asia, a big workforce of about 1,000 people in China. Um, and we are very strong in South America, um, in the US with about 800 people, and in Germany with uh, 1,800 people. We have a clear company values which say we care, we move, we deliver, and we take this we care very, 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 as a very, very important issue. So because we want to show our people and we want to live with our people that we really take care of all different people wherever they come from, whatever they live, whatever they think, whatever they believe. Perhaps we can go to the next slide, please. That's when we started an activity which is now three years old and which was, was and still is extremely successful in our internal communication. Because we said, we want to take a look on people who might be a little bit different than the, the norm, you know, if there ever is a normative, but we want to show the people who work with us and work for us, which uh, live their diversity. And we have a format in the intranet, which reaches out to 14,000 people worldwide. And every two weeks, we show a person from our company, um, be it, you know, from the LGBT community, be it talking about age, be it talking about culture, religion, um, ethnicity, uh, body positivity, whatever you can imagine. And what we felt and what we still feel today, there's enormous positive engagement when people open up and talk about their private thoughts, their private beliefs, their private lives. Next slide, please. I brought you some examples. So if you look at the, um, at the part, at the lower part, so this is a colleague from Atlanta in the US, 
Bradley Sweetheart, who was a team leader for many years for Hubbard Lloyd. And um, he was still in the closet. And uh, he, we were talking to him, he said, you know, now it's time to really come out. And then you see the headline, I don't want to hide anymore. Yes, I'm gay. And doing that publicly in the internet and talking about you know, his life and showing his partner whom he just married recently, you also see that you know, this news was liked a lot. You can see the number with a heart. So this is the likes of the people and lots of comments, encouraging comments. And this is what we like that people tell these people who are opening up in these interviews, yes, we are with you, we stand with you. On the other part, you see Fija Akbar from Pakistan. We had 100% males in our Pakistan office, 80 people, 100% males. Then we had a German manager and he said, we will only hire women until we have a balance in gender, 50-50. And after the balance was reached, 50% women, 50% men, he said, now we hire the first trans person. And Fija was the very first trans person we hired officially. Pakistan has lots of trans people living there with lots of problems. Also, you know, getting into the workforce, having the chance to have a career. And it was extremely nice for us to see that even, you know, the Pakistani people commented extremely positively on that, you know, they opened up, although in the Pakistani culture, it might not be, you know, uh, very usual that people open up to that. On the right hand side, you see Tom DeMeyer from Antwerp. He also talked about, you know, being an, uh, a gay person. Next slide, please. Some other examples, Gustavo Escobar from Guatemala. Guatemala has 80% Catholic population, a very conservative country. And he talked about not only being gay, but falling in love with a colleague in our Guatemala city office. So you can imagine how hard it must be for a young person of 27 years, but it was extremely popular and he got lots of backing, not only from colleagues from South America, but from people in, in the US, from people in Europe. Claudia Guimares, you can see on the right side, is a colleague from Sao Paulo. She was married 12 years to her husband. She separated from her husband. She took the kids and got married to her girlfriend. You can see the two ladies on the right hand side. And you can also see, you know, lots of positive um, feedback from the colleagues. And whenever we talk after the interviews to the people we have interviewed who got out and who talked about their personal life, people feel so much encouraged. People feel so strengthened. People feel so much supported that we really like that. The flip side is, unfortunately, of course, these comments mostly come from the Western world. So US, Canada, South America, Europe, we don't get lots of feedback from people in the Middle East. We don't get lots of feedback from people in Asia because, you know, with the collective culture, it seems to be a little bit difficult, but we continue. And we really want to strengthen that and really present our people to teach and educate our people, you know, that we really live this diversity and we sometimes even want to prioritize um, people which, which are living their, their diversity. Other flip side, we don't have a single person who came out to us from, from our seamen. Um, and this is still a huge challenge, you know, to convince people from on board to come out. 50% of our seamen are Filipinos. You know, the Philippines, very Catholic, very religious country very conservative country and still we have a long way to go. What we believe, you know, that we are on a very good path which we want to continue. Next slide, please. What do we have next slide, please? Yeah, here you can see after 176 years or 175 years last year for the very first time, we were participating in a gay pride in Hamburg with our rainbow container. And we had fortunately lots of people participating this year for the first time, we will participate in the gay pride in Atlanta, Georgia, where we also have our US office. And I think, you know, as much as I'm sorry about the fact that we started late, I would say four or five, six years ago, I think we can be very positive about what we have achieved so far. We feel lots of support. 
unfortunately, mostly from the Western world, as I said, but we believe, you know, the more you continue the course and the path, the more we will see support from Asia and from the Middle East as well. So that uh, was the, the key, what I wanted to show you, just to give you an impression, you know, that internal communication can move and change a lot. Thank you very much from, from Hamburg and looking forward to the discussion. Niels, thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful and detailed um, experience. And as you said, it's better starting late, late than not started. So congratulations for all that advances in the, in the recent years. And to continue in that, in that sense of experiences, of best practices for some of you, whoever is at home, who is seeing us online, we have here uh, another testament of good policies. So, uh, Ginger, thank you so much for being here. Could you share with us tonight about inclusive policies for LGBTQ plus employees at Lloyd's? Certainly, but first, I'd like to just recognize um, that Gustavo has, in 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 my mind, and I think in everybody here's minds, ha is seen as a rock star He's to the community. <laughs> so. And I think where that aligns with our artist community, perhaps there's a way we can create like an infographic of Gustavo as <laughs> that icon sure. for years to come for this event and celebrating, bringing community together. Because I really think in, in the discussions that were, we had earlier, we highlighted how important community is and belonging. And nowhere is that more important than when we're at sea. As seafarer, as a prior fellow seafarer, um, your crew members are your family. And I think that's what Gustavo has created here by bringing together everybody for community. And so we look at what would be the best support that we could provide everyone at sea. And so as far as best practices go, I'm very proud to work for a company like Lloyd's Register that I work for. So I will be going on 13 years with Lloyd's in December. And 30, so I have 30 years of experience in maritime, starting at sea for five years, and going on to many corporate companies uh, in their environmental health and safety de uh, departments. But I always found that even as a young child, I was very interested in protecting the planet, protecting people. And it didn't become clear to me so much later in my career that all of these things would align and be necessary for me to see like why I was so passionate about people. Why did I feel the need to represent the seafarer community? And when I was asked to join Lloyd's Register's Gender Equality Network, it all became quite clear. And it's arming our people with the tools that they need, the community, the support that they need. And it's gonna look different for all of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion colleague networks. So we have four within Lloyd's Register. And I'll, I'll just go back a little bit. Uh, so Lloyd's Register knows shipping. We're the first classification society. Do you have this oh, for the presentation? Thank you. So we're the first, the world's first maritime classification society. So we know a lot about shipping. And what we do is we do this for good, for the good of the world, because our mission and our goals are to stand together for a safe, sustainable, thriving ocean economy. That doesn't happen without the most diverse people in our workforce. And we only, we need that diversity to ignite innovation to ignite brilliance. And that only happens when we invite in the LGBTQIA plus community. Multi female, we've heard the statistics, the IMO states that between 1.2 to 2% of women rep are go to sea. Those numbers are so low. We need to do more to draw our, um, are diverse members of, of the community to seafaring pathways. And we know that children aren't really interested in going to sea. I went to a career fair a few weeks ago, and 
I had a few questions about saving the planet, but I didn't have any questions about how we draw youth to seafaring pathways. So they were interested in science, but not in going to sea. We need to make this more interesting. Um, and to do that, we have to have these tools. We have to have the best practices. And because Lloyd's is so invested in this, we're invested in, um, for the last few years, at creating these colleague networks where everybody feels safe to share, to tell their story in a um, protected uh, environment and where we have member-only communities. And what we found is we start to tell stories and we open the floodgates to feeling more connected, more protected, and that we're, we're safe and comfortable challenging behaviors and saying, that, that's not right. Because we know clearly in the past, whenever we've been put in situations where we just haven't said anything, sometimes it's because we're in shock, sometimes it's because we feel unempowered. But these colleague networks give us a way and a place and a space to be empowered and empower one another. And this is what Gustavo has created, is an environment that's going to multiply that effect and make it scalable. And we can take it to any country. We, so as an organization, there are 3,500 Lloyd's Register employees that are in 70 countries. And these countries have disparate policies against um, LGBTQIA plus community members of our team. So we also have to reflect and understand that even though we know something is wrong and that we want to stand up and stand out, we have to still recognize that in some countries, this is going to put people at risk. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need tools on how to, to manage this best and help our seafarers, our land-based um, team members as well, to navigate all of this. Um, And it is, it goes back to the aims of being here today, that we're all, why we're all here. Um, and I really like, I, I always think about it from a perspective of passion. And so for me, I call it my heart mark or my heart prints. If it passes the litmus test with that and protecting again people, how do we feel about the language that, are, that is being used in our HR um, job descriptions, our employment practices, and hiring practices? How we need community members from each of our diversity, equity, and inclusion teams to be part of the team that revises all of this so that it does invite LGBTQIA plus community into maritime. At our, at our company, we know this is necessary. And I hope that everybody here also wants to be part of that. So we can set up examples of what works from, lang from a language standpoint and what does not work and shuts doors. Um, so this is uh, our overall belonging strategy. And I just put this up to say, we've been working on this and thinking about it long and hard. We've also been investing in our people, in uh, making it very flexible for our leaders to be sponsors of each of the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion teams. So at our executive leadership committee, they are sponsoring, and it's, so it's going to the highest level. Our CEO is often in our meetings and showing their support of our communities. And um, so this is just an example of what has worked well for us. And we have a lot to learn. Again, it, as uh, previously mentioned, it is about education and awareness and not being f afraid or fearful about being different. Um, I, I can say as a, as a woman going to sea, I was always very different. I was always standing out in our of groups uh, of very 
mainly white men um, at sea, I was still at the decision-making table, so that was the important part. But I was there by being pretty silent and just voting and having an impact. And that's not okay. We need to be comfortable to be vocal. And that's what this, yeah. these discussions teach us. So we need to focus on inclusive recruitment. And we talked about that a little bit today. We're working on this and, and we've been uh, redrafting and crafting the language that we're using and reviewing it. And luckily we recently hired a chief people officer to help. So her team is focused on this and um, changing a lot of our policies. And I think it's wonderful when we can celebrate successes. And to do that, I think we tell stories. If we can bring these stories to life through our people, um, the video that was shown earlier in practice, bringing these actions to life. Gustavo, this is your next big project to start a motion picture movie. Because a lot of times people just want to connect and to see uh, to see your story, to see everybody's story here. And putting it to life through characters or movies, communications, is an idea. But you also have the art community that's backing you. So the sky is the limit on what's possible. And an icon, an infographic, is gonna be with us forever. <laughs> if we can figure out how to represent everyone, easily with a cartoon or something, an infographic that's recognizable on, on restrooms, why not, right? One of the things we find for our seafarers, for our community, is that in the shipyards, there's not spaces for um, women to, um, to change into their coveralls, things like that, to find a, re there's no female restrooms. So we often have to just use whatever restrooms are there. Um, all the balconies often can, if, you, if you're sleeping in a quarters overnight, your safety is questionable because a lot of the, um, there's no air conditioning in shipyards not often. So there's all these things to think about for us to consider. Thank but Thank you, thank you very much, Ginger, for those incredible remarks and I, I take, um, one of your expressions and thing is, is very important and we should all keep as a, as, a, as a reflection of today. And I should do this at, at the end, but I'm gonna just be reflecting. You said something that we need to be comfortable to be able to express ourselves. I think that's, that's the starting point from, from today and hopefully a starting point for more, more positive changes in the system. I wanna switch to Spanish. Eh, porque voy a ahora a hacerte unas preguntas a ti, William, eh, y gracias por, por estar acá, también por haber venido de, de fuera de Panamá. Eh, habiendo tenido esta perspectiva de las mejores prácticas o de buenas prácticas de las empresas o de empresas relacionadas a la industria eh, y lo que han logrado desde, desde tu expertise, desde tu experiencia, me gustaría saber ¿Qué estándares y recomendaciones existen dentro del sistema de Naciones Unidas para abordar la relación entre las actividades empresariales y los derechos humanos? Bienvenido. Gracias. Buenas tardes a, a todas las personas que se encuentran el día de hoy acá. Eh, y bueno, siendo yo el, el último panelista de, de la tarde, me quiero sumar también al agradecimiento eh, a Gustavo, naturalmente, por... Eh, proponernos el reto de, de generar esta discusión el día de hoy, eh, que básicamente nos lleva a reflexionar sobre eh, la responsabilidad que tienen las empresas y en particular en la industria marítima con los derechos humanos, eh, siendo que las empresas no han sido tradicionalmente eh, el sujeto de, del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos. Entonces llegan, eh, podemos decir que al, al final, en términos de, de la historia del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos. Y bien, yo como, como punto de partida quisiera 
Eh, partir por mencionarles, eh, este año es una fecha importante para el sistema de Naciones Unidas, es el 75 aniversario de la Declaración Universal eh, de Derechos Humanos, que como ustedes sabrán, eh, pues es un estándar que surge eh, posterior a la Segunda Guerra Mundial eh, y que básicamente eh, constituye la, la pieza angular de lo que hoy denominamos Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos. Eh, y me detengo un momento a, a mencionar el, el artículo 7 de la Declaración, que es básicamente eh, el origen de las normas de igualdad y de no discriminación, de igualdad ante la ley y de igual trato para las personas, eh, y que instruye prácticamente el resto de tratados internacionales eh, que el día de hoy reconocemos como, pues como algo totalmente habitual, ¿no? pero recordar que pues hace 75 años esto no era así. Yo quisiera detenerme un poquito hoy a hablar sobre otro estándar que es eh, particularmente importante en la, en la materia de las empresas y los derechos humanos, que son los principios rectores de Naciones Unidas sobre Empresas y Derechos Humanos. Este estándar eh, tiene aproximadamente ya 12 años de haber sido eh, emitido en el seno de las Naciones Unidas eh, y aunque es una serie de, de principios y de estándares relativamente nuevos, lo cierto es que eh, obtienen la mayoría de sus estándares de otros tratados internacionales. Entonces, de alguna forma, eh, es una nueva forma de ver la relación de las empresas con los derechos humanos, pero viene a fortalecer eh, pues este cuerpo internacional que denominamos Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos. Eh, dos o tres puntos importantes sobre los principios rectores antes de entrar a, a la materia. Eh, es que es un tratado que no es vinculante, eso quiere decir que no es obligatorio, eh, y sin embargo esto no quiere decir eh, no quiere decir que no ha sido eh, implementado e impulsado por diversas empresas eh, pues a nivel eh, global. Actualmente existe una discusión abierta sobre un tratado vinculante y esto es básicamente convertir este tratado eh, en una norma vinculante para los estados, que establezca también obligaciones y responsabilidades para las empresas. Eh, ¿Qué son entonces los principios rectores? Básicamente, los principios rectores eh, le hablan por una parte a los estados y le establecen una serie de obligaciones sobre comportamiento para las empresas que se encuentran en sus jurisdicciones, pero lo particular interesante de los principios rectores es que establecen una serie de responsabilidades para las empresas. Y vean que aquí el tratado cambia el lenguaje de obligación a responsabilidad. Y eso es precisamente porque no es un actor, eh, el empresarial, que pueda ser en el estado actual eh, obligado a tener un comportamiento con los derechos humanos. Eh, hablamos en la, en la jerga del, del derecho internacional eh, que los principios rectores tienen dos pilares. Entonces, el, el primero le habla a, las, a los estados, sobre ese no voy a, a profundizar mucho, eh, pero en el segundo pilar, y este es el que le habla directamente a las empresas, eh, los principios rectores básicamente eh, le piden una serie de comportamientos a las empresas y el primero de ellos es abstenerse de infringir. En otras palabras, como mínimo no lesione los derechos humanos establecidos en el derecho internacional. Sin embargo, el pilar 2 de los principios rectores no se queda ahí, sino que le establece a las empresas un deber de respeto respecto de los derechos humanos, pero adicionalmente a solicitarle que se abstenga de infringir derechos, le requiere también hacer frente a las consecuencias negativas que se producen a partir de las actividades empresariales. Cuando decimos consecuencias negativas, eh, pensemos en términos generales en impactos a los derechos humanos, el medio ambiente y a los derechos laborales de las personas. Pensemos en estas tres dimensiones. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo se cumple esta responsabilidad? ¿Cómo se traduce esta responsabilidad que en realidad tiene un planteamiento bastante genérico? Eh, los principios rectores establecen tres tipos de medidas o esperan tres tipos de medidas de comportamiento de las empresas. El primero de ellos es el compromiso político público que las empresas tienen que hacer con la sociedad eh, de respeto a los derechos humanos. Y este compromiso público pues tiene una particularidad y es que es unilateral, es un compromiso que las empresas hacen frente a la sociedad que no tiene necesariamente una forma de, eh, de requerir que sea obligatorio para las empresas. Eh, como parte de este compromiso, no es un compromiso eh, vacío, sino que se le pide a las empresas que eh, incorporen en sus sistemas de gestión estas responsabilidades en materia de derechos humanos. Esto quiere decir que se incorporen eh, en sus sistemas de gobernanza, en sus sistemas de gestión de la sostenibilidad y particularmente también en sus relaciones comerciales eh, y sus socios comerciales. Y algo muy importante, eh, y tal vez para ir aterrizando algunas particularidades de la industria marítima, le requiere que traslade esas expectativas a sus cadenas de su ministro, ¿no? Y sabemos que el negocio o la industria eh, marítima forma parte de todas las cadenas de suministro globales en la medida en que trasladan eh, bienes de un lugar a otro en el mundo. Entonces, en todos los intercambios eh, comerciales entre las empresas encontramos en el intermedio pues una empresa que transporta esos bienes. 
Eh, en segunda instancia, y aquí llego un poquito al, al corazón de esta expectativa, eh, los principios rectores le requieren a las empresas eh, que pongan en marcha procesos de debida diligencia en derechos humanos. Estos son básicamente procesos eh, preventivos que le permiten a las empresas identificar los impactos a los derechos humanos, en este caso particularmente a los de la población LGTBI, pero pensemos en impactos a los derechos humanos de cualquier otra población o incluso al medio ambiente. Eh, y no solo identificarlos, sino valorarlos a partir de la gravedad que tengan esos impactos eh, y generar planes de acción para cesar, prevenir y mitigar esos impactos. Pero adicionalmente, rendir cuentas sobre la forma como se abordan esos impactos. Y sabrán ustedes que gradualmente eh, hay una práctica que ya va siendo más recurrente y es que las grandes empresas transnacionales transparenten a través de sus informes de sostenibilidad cómo gestionan esos impactos. ¿no? Y eso es lo que entendemos un poco por transparencia. Y finalmente, la tercera expectativa es que las empresas faciliten o reparen los impactos a los derechos humanos. Ustedes saben que el, el principal mecanismo de reparación por excelencia son los sistemas judiciales en los países en los que nos encontramos. Eh, si el día de hoy una persona de la industria marítima es víctima de una violación a sus derechos humanos, pues probablemente se dirija a algún juzgado laboral en su país de origen o en el país en que se da la violación. Pero bueno, los principios rectores van un poco más allá y le requieren a las empresas establecer mecanismos propios de reparación. Y esto es básicamente mecanismos para adelantarse a que estas disputas se judicialicen. ¿no? Esto era un poquito el, el corazón entonces de los principios rectores. Eh, quería mencionar dos dos primos eh, hermanos o hermanas de los principios rectores. Eh, uno es la Declaración Tripartita de Principios para Empresas Multinacionales de la OIT eh, y, la, y la Política Social, que cubre un poco eh, la dimensión laboral de la conducta empresarial responsable y se enfoca específicamente en los derechos de los trabajadores. Y el otro, que no forma parte del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, pero que ha, ha empezado a adquirir relevancia y un carácter vinculante diferente, eh, son los estándares de la Organización para la Cooperación en el Desarrollo Económico, particularmente de las líneas directrices de la OCDE para empresas multinacionales. Eh, quería sumar un par de elementos más, y es que, eh, y por eso mencionaba inicialmente que no son estándares vinculantes, pero gradualmente eh, diversos países a nivel eh, mundial y particularmente en la Unión Europea han empezado a emitir ya normas de carácter obligatorio en sus países. Esto es, eh, normas que le requieren a las empresas llevar adelante procesos de debida diligencia en derechos humanos para identificar dichos impactos. Entonces, aunque los principios rectores no sean vinculantes, y les voy a poner el ejemplo de Panamá, en Panamá resulta que sí lo son para mi socio comercial en la Unión Europea. Entonces, claro, aunque no son obligatorios en Panamá, mi socio comercial me requiere generar este tipo de procesos de identificación de impactos. Entonces, aquí en la materia comercial encontramos uno de los principales drivers o motivos para las empresas y esto es para mantener sus relaciones comerciales en, en diversas partes del mundo. Eh, ¿Estoy sobre tiempo? Estás Iván? bien todavía. Sí, ok. Sí. Entonces resumo en, en un par de minutos algo adicional y es eh, que recientemente la, la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de Naciones para, eh, Unidas para los Derechos Humanos eh, emitió un documento que se denomina eh, Normas de Conducta para Hacer Frente a la Discriminación de la Población LGTBI y básicamente une los puntos eh, que les acabo de mencionar, y esto es eh, los estándares del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos con los estándares de los principios rectores. Y básicamente le traslada a las empresas cinco expectativas eh, generales que cubren diversos ámbitos del actuar de las empresas. Uno es la expectativa general de respeto con los derechos humanos eh, y en particular a través de estos procesos que les mencionaba, que son procesos de debida diligencia eh, en derechos humanos. Eh, les establece también la expectativa de eliminar la discriminación en el lugar de trabajo, a través de la contratación, del empleo, de las condiciones laborales, el tratamiento de la intimidad de la población LGTBI. Eh, la tercera es eh, una de carácter más proactivo, ya no solo eh, de eliminación de la discriminación, y es prestar apoyo a la población LGTBI en su lugar de trabajo para que constituyan entornos positivos y afirmativos donde las personas puedan realizar sus labores eh, en igualdad, como lo hace cualquier otra población. Pero adicionalmente, eh, una cuarta norma de, de conducta, de este documento de normas de conducta, eh, le establece también la expectativa a las empresas de que promuevan dentro del mercado comportamientos semejantes. ¿Cómo? A través de sus relaciones comerciales o a través de sus eh, cadenas de suministro río arriba o río abajo, básicamente en el lenguaje comercial que son los contratos, ¿no? los contratos entre empresas, en donde yo establezco cuáles son las, pa las pautas de comportamiento que yo quiero que mis socios comerciales eh, o cadenas de suministro tengan. Y finalmente, la última que tiene que ver con eh, la utilización de 
la identidad empresarial para promover también dentro de las comunidades la eliminación de este tipo de prácticas discriminatorias. Entonces, me quedo hasta ahí con... Gracias. Con Fantástico, súper interesante. Eh, tenemos poco tiempo en este panel, menos de 10 minutos, eh, muchas preguntas que responder, pero bueno, hay cosas pasando después de este panel, así que es importante cerrar eh, a tiempo. Por eso le voy a pedir a eh, Nils y Ginger just to answer the same question, hopefully in one minute, or like minute and a half, no more than two, please. Like I will be strong it's enforcing. But I think it's, it's very important to maybe finish or try to finish with positive remarks or things to do, calls to action. Um, so I'll ask both of you, what should be the focus of the maritime industry to attract and retain LGBTQ plus talent? You have two minutes. Uh, Nils, you're first. Yeah, I think there's, there's not even an alternative. When we look at Generation Z today, we see numbers that 69% of Generation Z um, explains that, uh, about themselves that they are heterosexual. And we have 18% in LGBT and we have 4% trans. So if the industry wants to survive and if the industry wants to attract talent, the industry needs to adapt to Generation Z. That's point one. Secondly, this industry for centuries has been a male industry. It has changed the last uh, years, the last decades, fortunately. So there are many more women uh, and we need to attract women. We need to, be, we need to attract LGBT because it is proven that diversity is making companies more successful. And I also think that diversity is making shipping lines more attractive for uh, young people to join these companies. Thank you. Go back to what I call five things to thrive. Um, and this isn't for shipping in general, but I would say it's about being very visible. Um, so purpose, the organization's purpose and mission to get people excited to come and work for them within Maritime, the people, celebrating our people, showing their stories, and making them very visible and championing what the difference, the uniqueness of our community and how important that is to our success. Partnership, it's that community, it's that none of, no, no one organization is going to solve these cha this challenge alone. We have to partner, align, and build this together through community. Um, and then action, the actions that need to happen through implementation, planning, guidelines. Fantastic, thank you. Um, a ver, William. Última pregunta, un par de minutos también, solo, ¿cuánto me quedan? Tres, bueno, tienes dos minutos. ¿Cómo se puede involucrar a las comunidades LGBTQ+, y defensores de derechos humanos en el sector marítimo para fomentar la inclusión y la diversidad? Sí. Dos minutos. Sí. Bueno, algo muy concreto, que casualmente no mencioné en, en la intervención, y es que eh, los procesos de debida diligencia como un mecanismo para identificar impactos, naturalmente se nutren de la inclusión de las poblaciones afectadas eh, para dimensionar esos impactos. ¿Y a qué me refiero? Pues cuando una empresa se sienta eh, a dimensionar cuáles son los impactos que tienen sobre los derechos humanos, el medio ambiente o los derechos de las personas trabajadoras, naturalmente si ese ejercicio lo hacen individualmente va a tener un resultado. Pero si a ese ejercicio se le incluye la participación y consulta con las eh, personas empleadas o con las personas miembros de la comunidad LGTBI, personas defensoras de derechos humanos o sindicatos de trabajadores, naturalmente el resultado va a ser diferente, ¿no? porque el dimensionamiento del impacto de la actividad empresarial eh, solamente va a estar completo eh, con procesos de consulta y participación. Entonces creo que también es una forma de incluir a la población en el LGTBI eh, en el direccionamiento de eh, las políticas de sostenibilidad de las empresas. Gracias. Eh, esto ha sido muy interesante. Lastimosamente estamos por terminar. Yo estaba supuesto a dar conclusiones por 10 minutos. Eso no va a ocurrir. Va a ser menos minuto. Eh, yo creo que las conclusiones ya las llevamos eh, a través de estas maravillosas intervenciones, de la diversidad de las, de las intervenciones. Pero de manera general, este panel pues ha dado un pantallazo de 
buenas prácticas y buenas prácticas exitosas. Son compañías que han logrado implementar, más allá de esas políticas, y me queda algo de que hablaron en los paneles anteriores, bueno, en, el, en uno de los, de los speakers hablaba que no solo era importante tener las políticas y aplicarlas, sino transformar, en hacer esa transformación que va más allá de decir, este es el código de ética o vamos a, vamos a marchar en Pride, no es cómo transformar dentro de una cultura, eh, dentro de tu empresa, que en realmente impacte las vidas de esas personas. Y yo creo que la experiencia de estas compañías hoy dan fe de qué se puede, de qué se puede y que funciona. Y ojalá se sostengan se en el tiempo. Eh, y la otra, la otra eh, arista de, de, este, de este panel ha sido eh, los, los recursos que Naciones Unidas brinda a las empresas para tener una guía, una guía hacia dónde ir, cómo aplicarlo y asimismo conocer de sus responsabilidades, porque no es para terminar en, en un llamado a atención, ni mucho menos, pero hoy las compañías son tan importantes como la participación del Estado. Y si las compañías entienden que tienen una responsabilidad también en... Eh, representar a la diversidad dentro de sus compañías y fuera de su compañía, a sus usuarios, a sus líneas de servicio, a sus clientes, eh, en, en, en la responsabilidad de llevar ese impacto, en respetar la dignidad humana de cada individuo, yo creo que construiremos un mundo mejor. Así que yo celebro estar cerrando el último panel del día noche de hoy. Gracias Gustavo por esta iniciativa excepcional y que nos vayamos todos a nuestros respectivos trabajos, hogares o espacios privados, llevando la buena noticia de que las políticas de inclusión se pueden y que la industria y el sector marítimo pueden hacerlo y lo van a hacer. Muchas gracias. Agradecidos con los panelistas y el moderador de este interesante panel. El Comité Organizador de Exist2 2023, esta conferencia desea hacer entrega de un reconocimiento a ustedes como miembros de este panel. Para eso invitamos al voluntario Gabriel de León, quien les entregará los mismos. Mientras tanto, agradecemos a Nils Hobb y Martin Illingworth por acompañarnos. A la señora Ginger Gerd. al señor William Vega, y por supuesto al moderador, moderador del panel, el señor Iván Chanis. Invitamos a los panelistas y al voluntario para que por favor se haga la fotografía oficial de este. Muchas gracias.